Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everybody out this morning to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And hopefully our prayer is that we've done just that this morning on a beautiful, crisp fall day. Maybe you all are dreading the arrival of winter, but I am excited to experience seasons for the first time in quite, quite a while. So uh, looking forward to, to getting a little cooler, already enjoying this quite a lot. So anyway, ask me again in a few months and maybe I've changed my tune, but, <laughs> but for now, this is really nice. So uh, I'm grateful for the, the beauty of God's creation and the seasons and how we get to experience that here. This morning, um, we have come to another One God, One Story lesson. That's the series where we're working our way through the Bible, one book at a time, and uh, considering a text from each book of the Bible that helps us connect that book to the overall storyline and narrative of the Bible as a whole. And so we have gotten to the book of Deuteronomy this morning. And usually I'm trying to do that on the last Sunday of the month, but it's kind of been all over the place because we had a meeting and then I was gone. And then next Sunday, I'll actually be in Aurora uh, preaching for the West Aurora group uh, while David Disselkamp is in Sierra Leone. Uh, so that's why I'm doing this lesson this week uh, to, to get ahead of that. But we've brought ourselves to Deuteronomy through this series. We talked about Genesis first. And in the book of Genesis, we talked about Genesis 17, which is where God gives Abraham the sign of the covenant. And uh, that was circumcision and talks about the covenant requirements that there would be for, for God's people. And then we got to Exodus and we talked about Exodus chapter 6 and how God delivers his people. We learned a lot about the nature of God through all these lessons. First, that God is a God of covenant. And then in Exodus, that God is a God of covenant deliverance and that he keeps his promises. He makes promises and he keeps them. And then we got to Leviticus. We talked about how God divides and he names. He separates things. And then he puts them into categories and he says, this is holy. This is not holy. You be holy for I am holy, not like those who are unholy. Uh, and so we looked at that's uh, how that is an element of who God is, that he, he is holy and he calls to himself those who are holy as he is. And then most recently, we looked at the book of Numbers. Uh, which has been neat because as we get closer and closer to the end of the Torah, we've gotten closer and closer to the books that we're actually studying in class uh, while this is going on. So uh, Numbers, we looked at chapters 13 and 14, which is the story of the spies that were sent in to spy out the land um, and how they went into the land. They saw that it was great, but they brought back an evil report, uh, an unfaithful report, a report that kind of uh, betrayed them that their trust was not in God that they didn't believe that he could and would fulfill his promises. And so then we looked at the uh, nation's response to that as a whole and how they were too afraid to go up. And then God promises consequences for their unfaithfulness, for their faithlessness. And then uh, they say, well, uh, hold on, we'll do it after all. And, and God says, no, you, I'm not with you. Don't do that. But they do go anyway, and they do so to their own demise. And so we looked at when the Lord is with us in that lesson and how we, we need to make sure that, that we fight uh, when the Lord says fight and that we go when he says go and we stay when he says stay. And so that brings us to Deuteronomy this morning. And I've been excited about this one because I am teaching Deuteronomy right now and uh, not that um, I have any amazing insights to share, but uh, that allows me to kind of overlap and do a little more study on both the class and the lesson to use that time similarly. And so I was thinking, well, man, I can just take my pick from this whole book because I'll be familiar with it. And then, of course, Wednesday night, I got through not probably not even a third of what I intended to get through in our Deuteronomy class. So uh, the way it worked out this morning, I'm going to preach from one of the, the chapters that we were going to cover in that class. But that works out anyway, because it'd be pretty hard to preach a lesson about a passage that connects Deuteronomy to the Bible's narrative overall and not preach on Deuteronomy 6. Um, and even if you're not familiar with that text uh, by the name of Deuteronomy 6, uh, you will probably recognize it as we get going here this morning. But Deuteronomy is a neat book. I've been looking forward to teaching it just in general because of what it is. Uh, it's the third most quoted in the New Testament. If, if you're not here for our class on Wednesday night, I'll just do a little bit of recap for you. And if you, if you are, then well, recap probably wouldn't hurt you either and probably wouldn't hurt me. So... Um, but I would encourage you, if, if you can at all, to be here for that Wednesday night class, not because I'm a great teacher or anything, but because what we're studying is so important and it's been so encouraging to spend the time together 
in God's word and encourage one another. Um, but in that class, we talked about in the, in, in the introduction how Deuteronomy is the third most quoted book in the New Testament uh, behind, I think, Psalms and Isaiah uh, Maybe right. I didn't write that down, so you may have to fact check me on that. But, but it's also extremely applicable to God's new covenant people. It talks about a lot of principles that carry throughout the entirety of Scripture, uh, which makes it especially cool for this series. But it's all also unique uh, in that we are currently studying it and at the beginning of it, and we're in this text right now. So excited to take that and really connect it to the overall biblical storyline this morning. So this morning, what we're going to talk about here in chapter 6 is the single most important commandment in all of Scripture. That's a pretty hefty claim, right? That this, is, this is the most important commandment in all of Scripture. Well, how do we get that? The book of Deuteronomy doesn't tell us that here in chapter 6. It doesn't say this is the greatest commandment, but Jesus does. Jesus tells us it is the greatest commandment when he quotes it in Mark chapter 12, which we will touch on later, but we'll stay in Deuteronomy 6 for now. But I feel relatively confident that most everybody here is pretty familiar with uh, this passage in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Like I said, even if you don't know it as Deuteronomy 6, once we read it, I think you'll, you'll recognize it pretty quickly. So with that familiarity in mind with this greatest commandment, my task this morning will be threefold. First of all, I want to remind us of the basic truths of this great commandment. Secondly, I want to try to show how it forms a thread that connects the book of Deuteronomy to the broad tapestry of the overall biblical narrative, which again is the purpose of the series. And then thirdly, my task this morning especially will be to challenge us with some timeless applications of this great commandment. And so I've selected the points that I want to make this morning in a way that hopefully they are all truths from Deuteronomy chapter 6 that carry through the entire biblical narrative. From the garden, we can see these, to Israel here in Deuteronomy, to Jesus in the Gospels, and even to Revelation and beyond. And hopefully those things also have application for us today as well. And I think they all do, as is often the case with God's Word that lives. So let's begin this morning by reading. Sorry, that was a bit of a long introduction, but we'll get into the text now. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. So we'll stop there. As we consider the text here, there are some things that stand out before we even get to the actual greatest command itself. There's a lot there in those first, first three and four verses uh, there. And so one of those is where Moses tells Israel to fear the Lord your God. He says this is critical. There's a healthy fear of God that is needed in the Israelites and in us today as well. I think sometimes we shy away from that. We, we enjoy talking about the love of God, and certainly God is love, as we've already sung this morning. I want to thank Dylan on that note for picking out songs that tie in so well with, with the lesson this morning. But I, I think we need, to, we need to have a healthy fear of God. This is really an initial foundation that Moses gives the children of Israel on which the greatest commandment can be built. You can't get to loving God unless you fear him and understand who he is, is really at the heart of that. The Israelites, in their case, they've been shown God's greatness. They've been shown God's power uh, through the fire, which is emphasized in chapter 4. God appeared in mighty and visual, vivid ways uh, in Mount Sinai, particularly in view there. And so having seen that, having experienced that, having that in their history, they had plenty of reason to fear him uh, and know his majesty, to know his awesomeness, and to be acquainted with why they ought to have a healthy respect, a healthy fear for who God is and how great he is. 
And so we might tend to think, okay, yeah, they, they had that in the Old Testament. Fear of God, I see him being very punitive a lot of times uh, in very vivid ways. But the New Testament, maybe that sort of excludes the fear thing a little more. Because so much is said in the New Testament about confidence and grace and love and mercy. And yeah, a lot is said about that in the New Testament. Truth is, a lot of, uh, about that is said in the Old Testament as well. But in actuality, in the New Testament, much is said that instructs disciples of Jesus to fear God as well. So fear of God isn't just for people of the Old Covenant. Fear of God is for all those who would seek to love God. Uh, we see this in one instance in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and verse 1, he says, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. So clearly, this is not just an Old Testament concept that we need to have a healthy fear of God. Uh, there is a very real sense in which we should fear God today. And that will make us stand out from most people in the world who have no fear of God before their eyes. But that's our task as believers, to fear the Lord our God. But another thing we see here in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 2 is that there's a family aspect to fearing God. This isn't something we do on an island. At least it shouldn't be. That children and grandchildren are referenced here and that they should also fear the Lord uh, their God. It says in verse 2 that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son. I think that's important because it's not spoken of in a future tense. It's not saying that you may fear the Lord your God and then when your kids grow up, then they can start fearing God too. That you may fear the Lord your God and that your son may too and that your son's son also will fear the Lord your God. They're not excluded. Children and grandchildren aren't. They're not excluded from fearing God until they hit some sort of age at which, okay, now you better learn about this. It's time we taught you. This is something everyone needs to do now. We don't have to understand everything about God. In fact, if we think we understand everything about God at any point, we should probably check ourselves. But the point is that we need to understand everything about God in order to fear him and respect him. And so from a very early age, our task with our kids and grandkids, is to instill in them a fear and respect for God. And this is an important foundation. And of course, that's not just an Old Testament principle. The New Testament has a lot to say about younger people participating in the faith of their parents and grandparents. Think about where Paul instructs uh, people to have the older people teach the younger people, to be examples and also in, in, in word as well as deed. Uh, Titus chapter 2 comes to mind in terms of instructions like that. So this is a critical role even in our day of parents and grandparents. Uh, so let's talk about grandparents first. Now, I know it's a lot of fun for grandparents to spoil their grandkids uh, when they can have them for just a real short amount of time and then send them back. That's, that's fun. That's part of the fun. You did your time, right? You, you raised your kids. All right, now you get to, you get to enjoy grandparenting. And so I get that it's, it's way more fun to do the spoiling and let parents do the hard work. But the pattern we have here in Deuteronomy shows us something important, I think. Uh, I'm not going to stand up here and condemn grandparents spoiling their grandkids. In fact, as an oldest grandchild, I was a beneficiary of quite a lot of excessive spoiling <laughs> early in my time uh, as a grandchild. Um, but I think the biblical principle we see here is so, so important. And that's that grandparents have a crucial role in helping their grandchildren to fear the Lord. You can't neglect that. If grandparents neglect that role, they do so to the spiritual harm of their grandchildren. This is important. It's not only on them, but if they only ever spoil your grandkids and never think to teach them about the Lord, and show them what it means to fear him and have a respect for God in your actions and in your word, you're hurting your grandkids spiritually. So... There's a note about grandparents, but coming back to parents, it's absolutely essential that parents demonstrate and teach their children to fear the Lord. The point isn't to teach terror of God, to teach them you ought to just be afraid and cower and walk around and worried he's going to strike you down. That's, that's not the point. The point is to teach them to recognize and respect God's greatness and God's love. A healthy respect for God has to be the foundation for our kids. 
It's something that I have in mind a lot right now as I think about the overwhelming task of parenting that's coming our way. But teaching the fear of the Lord is key because of this. It shows that God is greater than us and we are dependent on him. And that's important because it sets up their view of God correctly in order to obey what God asks of his people. Uh, if we don't get it right that God is here and we are here, if we don't teach our kids that early on and they invert that and say, well, God is whatever I want him to be and I am the boss, that's going to cause so many problems and their entire world is going to be upside down as they go through life. And you can start to understand why the world as a whole is upside down. So if we have this foundation, though, if we fear God, if we teach our kids that God is here and we are here, we respect his greatness and that he is in charge of us, that sets up a foundation for things to be ordered as they ought to be. And from there, we can proceed to the most important commandments. But it's important to set up our view of God correctly because the next thing we learn in Deuteronomy 6 in verse 3 is that God's promises and God's covenant uh, has expectations associated with them. God's promises are, are contingent, you might say. Uh, here in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 3, he says, Here therefore, O Israel, be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. There's two promises, two key promises that he references here. One being the nation, he's going to multiply them. And then one being the land, he's saying to do them in the land flowing with milk and honey. These promises weren't just like nice to haves, like when you promise your kid a, a treat, like a little, I don't know, gummy or something, if they behave well in the grocery store or something. These promises were key to Israel's identity. Israel was staking everything on these. They were going off through the wilderness in pursuit of this land. They were trusting that God was going to multiply them. These were core to their identity. And God was fully prepared to deliver these. Clearly, he's shown that when they are following him, honoring him, trusting him, he's going to make it happen. He's ready to do it. But yet this generation's fathers, remember where we are here in Deuteronomy, this generation's fathers were the ones who reacted poorly to the spies report and who were the unfaithful spies. And what that generation had shown them their fathers had shown them that these promises were made contingently. Because when they didn't believe and they didn't obey God and they didn't trust God, guess what happened? The promises were not given. These promises are conditional. It's not because God doesn't love them. It is because he loves them and he wants this relationship with them that will benefit them. And he wants them to be true to it in order to experience the covenant blessings. But we've seen this principle of, of contingency in God's promises, even in our first one God, one story lesson with Abraham. We're looking at the sign of the covenant uh, in Genesis chapter 17. And we, we see in verse 9 of Genesis chapter 17, uh, God says, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. And the context of that is, back up in verse 2, that I may multiply you greatly. So there's the promise but there's a condition to the promise. And so it is our duty, our task, to meet those conditions, to be faithful. God's not asking perfection necessarily. He's not, because <laughs> clearly Israel had failed at that. But God's asking them to continue to seek him, and to be faithful to the covenant. And that's the condition that he wants from them, and even from us today as well. Because ultimately, the promises of the new covenant are also contingent. The new covenant is not exactly the same as the old covenant, but the promise being contingent is similar. We have to obey God if we want to receive his promises, his covenant blessings. When you think about the book of Hebrews, that's a, the entire book is a giant warning flag that if we don't stay faithful and obedient to Jesus, then we won't enter the rest that has been promised. And so that shows us Still today, God's promises are contingent on us being faithful, us staying true to him, uh, us being willing to obey him. Again, not that we uh, have obeyed him perfectly in the past, but he has redeemed us in order that we may now obey him fully with all our might, as we'll get to here. 
So that's another important thing that this text tells us before we even get to the greatest commandment. But then we get uh, on to verse 4. And verse 4 tells us something else extremely important. That's that the Lord alone is God. Verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Well, he's already referenced this earlier in the book. We emphasized in our class Wednesday night, uh, chapter 4, And verse 35 of Deuteronomy, which Deuteronomy 4.35 says, To you it was shown, uh, talking about what God did in Egypt and the Exodus and that sort of thing, to you it was shown, you might know that the Lord is God. There is no other besides Him. That's what this verse is telling us in chapter 6. God is singular. God is one. There is only one God. There's nobody like Him. And that is his nature. I think that's an important thing that we learn here. This is what God is like. And this is the foundation of everything God is like. There's only one like him. He is alone. The Lord is one. He is singular. And I think it's also interesting to note that Jesus actually begins his quotation when he quotes this in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 and 29. He doesn't start quoting in verse 5. Rather, he starts quoting in verse 4. It would be easy for him to say, yeah, the most important commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. But he says, no, the the greatest commandment is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God. Clearly, this is part and parcel to loving God, realizing who God is. It's also a, a critical foundation for the greatest commandment. And so the lesson to Israel and to us is, don't look to anyone else to be what only God can be. Don't look to anyone else. Israel time and time again does that, whether it's themselves, whether it's an earthly king, that God is actually their true king, as we see later on in their narrative, or whether it's an idol, whether it's a golden calf. Again, (laughs) time and time again, they try this with idolatry. And uh, we look at that and we say, that's, that's crazy, but don't we do that sometimes too? Do we ever look to things that are not God as if they can be to us what God is and what only God can be? I think we all do that sometimes. And perhaps... One of Israel's challenges, one of their many challenges, may be our biggest challenge in this. And that's that sometimes we look to ourselves to be what only God can be. We are human. We are created. We are not infallible. We are imperfect. We are selfish sometimes. God is none of that. We are mortal. God is eternal. But yet, how many times do we look to ourselves to to figure out what we ought to do? How many times do we look to ourselves to make our decisions and forget God in the process? We can't look to anyone else to be what only God can be. The Lord alone is God. And if we are to please him, if we are to be able to follow the greatest commandment, this has to be the starting place. It has to be. And really, when we think about God being singular, God being unique, totally unique among all others, it is his singular nature and his total uniqueness that demands our love and our adoration with all that is in us. And that's what's seen and commanded in verse 5. Love the Lord with all, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength or your might. This greatest command, something important to note about it. I think it's rooted in God's nature. We've already talked about God's nature, how he he is singular and unique. Um, But God has a lot of attributes that are key that we kind of pick up on through this command and through what Moses has already talked about in these last few chapters in Deuteronomy. But this command to love the Lord your God with all that is in you, it's rooted in God's nature in two ways. First of all, his nature demands it. His nature demands it. When you look at his greatness, for example, in chapter 4 and verse 32, it says, For ask now of the days that are past, which were before you, since the day that God created man on the earth, 
and ask from one end of heaven to the other whether such a great thing as this has ever happened or was ever heard of. God is greater than all others. And a God like that, who is actually greater than everyone else that has ever existed, he deserves our love. That kind of a God, him simply existing, demands that we love him. And, and so we see that in his greatness. But we also see that in his mercy. If you back up a verse to verse 31, that's in a section that's talking about there in, in chapter 4 of Deuteronomy, verse 31. That, that is at the end of a section talking about when Israel, if they are unfaithful, how they can seek God and they can still find him. And then verse 31 says, For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. Even when Israel forgets the covenant, which they do, even when we forget our covenant with God, God is faithful. But not only is he faithful, he's merciful. And he shows us that. That even when we do not deserve any mercy at all, God is merciful to us. He's gracious to us. And a God like that, a God who is both great and can do anything, but who is also merciful and extends us grace when we do not deserve it in the least, a God like that deserves our love. So that is God's nature. It demands our love. And then those, those things are combined in verses 33 and 34 of chapter 4. He says in verse 33, Did any people ever hear the voice of a God speaking out of the midst of the fire, as you have heard, and still live? Again, God's greatness, but also God's mercy. Verse 34, Or has any God ever attempted to go and take a nation for himself from the midst of another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders, and by war, by a mighty hand and outstretched arm, and by great deeds of terror, all of which the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? God has done great things. But he's done them for you when you did not deserve them. And a God like that, I think of the line in the hymn that we often love to sing before the Lord's Supper, when I survey the wondrous cross, love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. And is that not certainly true just based on who God is and who he has proved himself to be to us? So this command to love the Lord your God with all, it's rooted in God's nature in that his nature demands it, but it's also rooted in God's nature in that his nature shows us how to do that. We wouldn't know how to love God with all that is in us if God hadn't first shown us how to love and what love is. We see this in chapter 4 as well in verse 37. It's talking about how God did all these signs for their sake, and then in verse 37, it says, And because he loved your fathers and chose their offspring after them and brought you out of Egypt with his own presence by his great power. And then, of course, the conclusion in verse 39 is, Know that the Lord is God and there is no other. But the point is he loved them. This is why he did all this. When they didn't deserve it, that's what love is. And God shows it to them. Otherwise, they would have no idea. Neither would we. We'd be squandering, trying to figure out how do we love because our nature often is to be selfish. But we see this in the New Testament as well. Maybe you're familiar with uh, 1 John 3.16, a passage we often think about when it comes to love. But it says in 1 John 3.16, By this we know love that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. If we are truly to love God, we have to learn how from him. We have to learn how by watching how he has loved us. That's what love is. Love is sacrifice. Love is laying down yourself and your goodness for the sake of others, not using it selfishly. And so we learn how to do that by looking at God all throughout time, certainly in Jesus most of all, but all throughout time. But where that takes us is, if we truly love God, and this also helps us learn how to love like God does, if we truly love God, then we're going to love not only how he loves, but also what he loves. We're going to love what God loves. 
If you look at, in the Ten Commandments in, in chapter 5, the first few commandments there are talking about loving God, talking about being faithful to Him, not having an idol, honoring Him as the only God. But then the second half of the commandments are all things about loving your neighbor. But those things are connected. They're not isolated sections. If we love God, God loves all these things. God, God loves life. God loves fidelity and faithfulness. God loves uh, integrity and not stealing. God loves the truth. So if we see what God loves, then we will love that too. And that will lead us to the second greatest commandment. But it all flows from loving God. And that's where it has to start. So it's rooted in God's nature in two ways. His love demands it, or excuse me, his nature demands it. His nature shows us how. But another thing I want you to notice this morning is that the command is to love God with all. All. He says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might or your strength. Let's see. Heart, soul, strength. That pretty much sums it up. Got anything left over and take away your heart, your soul, and your strength, your body? There's nothing left over. And all of these are to be given entirely to loving God. That word all is repeated. All your heart, all your soul, all your strength. And the point is, this is to be more than just one of a ton of law codes that they put up on the shelf in the Israelite library, and then when a situation comes up, ah, oh, I wonder what code 137.11.12 says. Oh, let's pull it down, dust it off. No, oh, didn't know that. This is not to be that. This is to be lived. This is to be who they are. This is to be their way of life. This is to be all they are. And again, when we go into verse 6, following up from this, he returns to this theme that he's already started earlier on of how this is a family thing. This isn't something kids get to wait on. Kids are excluded from. You don't have to learn about this yet. That's not what this is. This is something we all do, from the youngest to the oldest. And just as children are to learn to fear God from their parents and grandparents, so they are to learn this too. How are they going to learn it, even when they're super young? Well, first, by word. He says, these words that I command you uh, today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. So we're to teach them in word. We're to tell them about these things. You know, we teach our kids a lot of things over the course of their growing up years, even from the very beginning. We teach them, we want them to be able to function on their own, so we teach them how to tie their shoes, and use the bathroom, that sort of thing. We want them to be successful later in life when we're not around to help them out, so we teach them basic skills that they're going to need in life. And we make sure they go to school and that they learn the basic subjects, how to do basic math and how to write and how to read, and you're going to need those things to be successful. We want them to be good citizens and likable people. So we teach them how to be nice. We teach them how to talk to people. We teach them how to deal with people. We teach them how to, how to work with people. We want them to be healthy. We want them to be safe. And so we teach them, you know, these are healthy choices. These are safe choices. This is how you drive safely. This is how you obey the speed limit, mostly. We teach them <laughs> maybe better by word than indeed on some of these things. But, but we want them to be healthy and safe, so we teach them how to do that. And of course, we want them to love Jesus, so we take them to church and hope they pick something up along the way. And maybe by osmosis, they'll get it. Wait a minute. That doesn't add up. But so many times, that's what we do, I think. If we want our kids to love God, if we want our kids to follow Jesus all their lives, we have to teach them. It does not happen by accident. We have to teach them daily. And this principle here in Deuteronomy tells and shows us just that. So we teach them this by word. We teach them by what we say. But perhaps as much or even more so, we teach them by example. He talks about, uh, you shall teach them diligently your, to your children, and shall talk of them in all these times. And he also says, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And even back in verse 6, he says, these words that I commend you today shall be on your heart. Again, the emphasis of the heart. But what that means is you live this yourself. You model this for them. You know something about kids that I've noticed, and I'm sure you have too. Kids can tell when you're being fake. 
they can tell when you're not genuine. You might think you know, you've, you've hit it well, you keep it in the back room, but, but they know. They know. And so if we want our kids to be faithful disciples, there's no shortcut, there's no faking. We must commit ourselves to being faithful disciples ourselves. There's no way around that. We have to love God with all that is in us. Because here's the thing, if we hold back some from God, and you say, oh, I'm not going to give you all, but I'll give you some, and maybe they'll see that part and I'll hide this. But they're going to know that. And then if we hold some back from God, who's to say they're not going to hold back more? Be like, well, who set that amount? I mean, I could just give him a little bit because you didn't give him everything, so why not? And eventually, maybe they'll find themselves holding back everything from God, giving him absolutely nothing at all. The command to love God with all our heart, our soul, and our strength is important for us in ourselves in terms of our own spiritual destiny, our spiritual life, but it is just as important for us in terms of the spiritual destiny of the young people among us, our kids and our grandkids. So there's a lot of important concepts that we've talked about. Loving God with all of ourselves, it's critically important. But here's the big million-dollar question this morning. How do we actually do that? How? (laughs) I mean, we could talk about this and say we ought to do this, but but how? (laughs) That's the real question. Well, let's start by another question, as Jesus often did. How about this question? What is love? If we're supposed to love the Lord your God, and not the 80s song, you know, what is love, love? That's what I think of, but anyway, uh, but not that song. What is love, scripturally? Scripture tells us that the greatest demonstration of love is to sacrifice one's life. John chapter 15 and verse 13, greater love has no man than this, than that he lay down his life for his friends. Sacrifice, that's what love is. It's sacrifice. And when we think of sacrifice, the greatest sacrifice ever made, of course, was Jesus' sacrifice of his life on the cross for us. And so when we think of what love is, We've got to have a picture in our minds, not just an abstract definition. And the picture we ought to have in our minds is Jesus and sacrifice. That is love. And so with that picture in mind of what love is, let's consider how we live out that sacrificial love and practice the greatest commandment. And so to do that, I'd invite you to look back into the text here in Deuteronomy 6. When we look back at the words that follow that directive to love God, we see three categories that we talked about briefly earlier. And I would suggest to you that these are the key to learning to love God, as Jesus demands that we do when he quotes this passage and when he calls it the greatest command. And so the first category is with all our heart. Right? That's, that's the first way he says we ought to love God. And that tells us that loving God means sacrificing our thinking and our emotions to him. That's what our heart is. And so loving God means we let him control our thinking. We sacrifice it to him. God dictates how I think, not me. That also means that loving God means we allow his will to trump our emotions. We don't let our emotions lead us around and drag us wherever they want us to go. That's difficult because our feelings are strong sometimes. Very strong. But the truth about emotions is that they make a whole lot better followers than leaders. And so God calls us, when we love him with all our heart, is to give our emotions control to him. We're also to love God with all our soul. And that tells us that loving God means giving him our very being. It means giving him our existence. It, loving God means we make God the center of our existence, which sounds obvious, but it's a little more difficult than maybe we think when we consider just how often we make ourselves the center of our existence. I know that's true for me. Loving God means we orient our lives around him. He is the one around whom it all revolves. Every decision, every thought, every action revolves around God at the center with all our soul. And then finally, with all our strength. Loving God means submitting our time and our energy. That's our strength our bodies, completely to him. Loving God means we spend our time not on things that please us, but on things that please him. 
along those lines, loving God means we don't wear ourselves out on things that have no spiritual value and then give God whatever's left over. Sorry, I already wore myself out with all this other fun hobbies that I like, but it doesn't do anything for me spiritually. God, you get my shred of energy that's left over at the end of the day. God doesn't get the leftovers. God gets the best, even when it's not what we naturally want to do. This is hard. We have things we enjoy. We have things we want to do. Good things that, that God has given us to enjoy under the sun, but if we don't give God the first fruits, then those things have been taken out of their place and made an idol. Love God with all our strength. Give God the best, even of our time and of our energy. So to wrap this up, if we love God in all these ways, sacrificing ourselves, which is what love really is, and bending to his will, then where's that going to lead us? It's going to lead us to love our fellow man as well. It's going to lead us to treat people correctly. Again, back in the Ten Commandments in chapter 5, that first half of loving God, that leads to the second half of what we ought to do in relation to our fellow man. We are to love God. Well, guess what God loves? God loves relationship. So when he says, honor your father and mother, he wants that wholeness of relationship. God loves life. God is life. God made life. God gives life. And so when he says, do not murder, he's saying, I want you to love life like I love life. God loves covenant fidelity. God is always faithful to his covenant. We saw that in chapter 4. We've seen that all the way through the Torah so far. And that's why God says, don't commit adultery. Because marriage is a covenant. And when you're in a covenant that I've instituted, you'll take it seriously. And you'll always be faithful. And God is a God of integrity. He loves that which is truthful. And that's why he says, don't steal. And God is a God of justice. God is always just, always righteous. And that's why he says, don't bear false witness. So God loves relationship. God loves life. God loves covenant fidelity. God loves integrity. God loves justice. But not only does God love all these things, God is all these things. He is the originator of relationship from the garden, from the creation on. He lives eternally. He is life. He's made a covenant with his people. He is a God of covenant. He's the definition of truth and integrity. And Pilate says, what is truth? The truth was in front of him. God is truth. And God, of course, is always just. He's the definition of justice. He's the standard by which we measure justice. And so if we love God, then we're going to love what God loves, which is also what God is. No matter what time we're living in, whether it's Deuteronomy, where, where this book is taking place, and the Israelites are on the cusp of entering the promised land, and getting a second shot at that with a new generation, or whether it's today, whether it's all of us here this morning. Either way, God's people ought always to be defined by these things. We're to love God above all, and that is to lead us to treat others with the love that God shows them and shows us each day and always has. I hope we can all rededicate ourselves to loving God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength. Do you love God this morning? Do you really? Give that question some thought. Has that led you to sacrifice your whole self to him? That's what love is. Does your life, does my life model pure relationship, a respect for life, covenant fidelity, and integrity, and justice? Is that what our lives look like? Let me encourage you to think on these things. Start with loving God, and then follow the path of loving God wherever it leads you as you sacrifice your life to him. And in doing so, we will find God's covenant blessings are sure to follow. Do you have those blessings? Are you sure of those this morning? If you're not, and you know what you need to do, we would love to help you with that. While together we stand and while we sing.